Okay, I think we can get started. Uh, so it's a pleasure to have uh, uh, Professor Great Tejasvi Benam Madhav Narendra today with us. Uh, uh, Teja did his uh, bachelor's in India at IIT Kanpur and then uh, did his PhD in Caltech uh, with uh, Chris Hirata, who's visiting us intermittently this semester. Uh, then uh, he was a postdoc uh, here. According to his website, he's still a postdoc here. <laughs> 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 so, so. Yes, 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 of course, yes. yes. <laughs> but uh, I visited him in UCSB, so I know that he's now a professor at uh, UCSB and also uh, visiting professor at ICTS in India. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> hiding uh, somewhere, I don't know. <laughs> I won't tell you. <laughs> okay. uh, so he works on a broad range of topics, going from early universe cosmology to astrophysical lensing to gravitational wave data analysis. And a few others that I forgot, uh, but that's yeah, a lot of topics. And today he'll be talking about binary neutron stars. Done two years. Thanks, Jay, for the introduction. And as uh, as a previous postdoc, it's nice to be back. I I missed a few flights, and I took an unplanned red eye flight. So if I'm not fully coherent, I can use that as an excuse. It's a good reminder of my sleep schedule when I was here. <laughs> okay, so let's. So today I'm going to tell you about two things that sort of we finished up recently, and both things have something to do with binary neutron stars and how we extract physics from the signals, but they're not really related. <coughs> so let's. So yeah. So I'm going to aim this talk not at someone who's like a world expert in the topic though so if you're bored feel free to ask questions unrelated to what i'm saying but yeah so the general context of the talk is that so you know we are interested in seeing in extracting physics about binary neutron star about neutron stars in general and about binary neutron stars in particular from observations of them taken from any gravitational wave data. So the overall context is, so we have these events that occur. So there are two of them that we have detected so far in previous observing runs from the two detectors, the LIGO, Livingston and Hanford detectors. And if you take any of the detections and you look at the spectrogram where you're plotting the time on the x-axis and the frequency on the y-axis, and this is plotting the power. So you can see this characteristic chart that is the signature of these neutron stars. <coughs> so how do we go from here to extracting some physics from this? So let's I just give a brief review of <coughs> what sets the <coughs> characteristics of the signal that we see and how do we extract information from it. So at the lowest order, right? So the signal you can understand it as quadrupole emission from the configuration of masses with some time varying quadrupole moment. And since it's a quadrupole moment, that immediately tells us that the strain, which is the second derivative of the quadrupole, is it, uh, it has a frequency that is twice the frequency of the Keplerian orbit or quasi Keplerian orbit. Right? And so if, we, if I just try to do a sort of Newtonian estimate, right? So this, each derivative picks out a factor of omega, and then the mass quadrupole is reduced mass times this square of the semi-major axis. And the reduced mass, we can write it in terms of the total mass and what is known as the symmetric mass ratio, which is a dimensionless number that goes from zero to a quarter. The lower end is for higher high mass ratio events, and the upper end is for equal mass events. And then we can use Kepler's law to relate the semi-major axis A to the period of the frequency omega. And then if we collect the powers of frequency together and the remainder factors out into a combination of masses, which is called the chirp mass. So to leading order, the amplitude of the signal is set by the chirp mass. Right. And so, so this is the amplitude. But what is important for detection is the frequency evolution of the signal. So in order to, again, get a simple idea of what that is, so we can start with the Newtonian expression for the orbital energy, which we can again write it in terms of the chirp mass and the frequency omega. And then we can take the power emitted by such a system, right, which is 
here instead of in instead of electromagnetism where you have q double dot square here this is triple dot and again you can write that in terms of the charge mass and the frequency and if you equate the rate of change of energy to the power you get the rate you get an equation for the evolution of the frequency omega and if you solve that you get that it evolves as a power law with time and that is the origin of this characteristic chart and if i turn it around i can say if i start out with a particular minimum frequency which is set by for example where my detector is sensitive then this also tells me how long the signal is that i am looking for or that i am seeking to understand right so for the heavy events so here the numbers i put in are for the heavy black holes like 15 or 9 14 and they, these are fractions of a second you know few hundreds of milliseconds by if you instead use the mass to be the if it or put in the mass of a neutron star and you get that it is minutes right and for a real signal it doesn't chirp all the way to infinity it is cut off by the size of the object and so to go from the frequency evolution to the wave form so it's useful to think of the orbital phase which is roughly the number of cycles that have elapsed so you integrate the frequency with time and it is some dimensionless number which is a steep power law of the frequency that you start with and then if you now try to write the frequency domain waveform from the time domain picture i had before under the stationary phase approximation you get that the amplitude is just a power law of frequency f to the minus 7 6 and in the phase the argument of the complex number is related to the orbital phase Right. So this is the signal. This is the time domain signal, and if you Fourier transform it, you get this is the absolute value of the Fourier transform. So you see the characteristic power law, and then it is cut off, as I mentioned previously. This is for a thirty thirty solar mass. I have a simple question to to, under, to go to the power spectrum. You need to Fourier transform that signal, but that's not strictly periodic. What is usually done? Uh, so this signal is okay. it's not a power spectrum it is more it is mod of h of f square so for example if you are if you have a minimum frequency that you are sensitive to then this is square integrable so you can just take the fourier transform does that make sense yes okay so i described the overall characteristics of the signal but then how do they depend on the parameters of on all the parameters of the of the of the of the merger so we can divide the parameters that describe the merger into two classes one is so called intrinsic parameters which don't depend on how we are located or oriented relative to the merger and this other set is extrinsic parameters which are like you know useful for observers for example So they tell you where it is located and how it is oriented relative to us. So for binary black holes that are in quasi-circular orbits, the intrinsic parameters are you know there are eight in number, there are two masses and three components of each body's angular momentum, spin angular momentum. And if you have extra parameters such as for neutron stars, you they add to the intrinsic parameters. But technically, for neutron stars, there are infinitely many intrinsic parameters. and then the ex- there are seven extrinsic parameters you know so the time the distance and then the sky location and then the inclination and uh, the, you know where the merger is in in its orbit related to some fixed direction and uh, in uh, polarization which is roughly you know how tilted the ellipse looks like is the inclination and then if you rotate it you get an extra polarization so in the simplest signals if you assume that the objects have aligned spins so this instead of six numbers for the spins you have two numbers and you restrict to quadrupole emission which is what i described in my simple analysis before right so the you can write you can see that the two polarizations are not independent so here the polarizations are for a for a signal that is coming out of the plane of the screen There is, you know, there are two different ways in which it can deform a, a circular sort of arrangement of particles, and the two polarizations are not independent. 
they, they are just related by some scalar factor and some phase for and under these assumptions. And then what a detector actually sees is a linear combination of these two polarizations with the particular coefficients decided by the antenna pattern of the detector at the location where the merger is. So there are these F plus and F cross, which are just scalar numbers. So overall, the if you just look at the, detect the signal as it appears to you in a detector, right? so if you just take H of F, which is you know, some complex number at each frequency, so the amplitude A of F is a simple power law of frequency, as I mentioned before. But then it has an extra factor which depends on the detectors because of the F plus and F cross. And the phase, it has one piece which depends on all the extrinsic parameters. So this, I, this you know, third phi C and then the part to do with the polarization response of the detector. And then it has a arrival time, which is you know, this T sub K. So all the things with sub K, right, they depend on the detector. So they are extrinsic parameters, right? They fix the extrinsic parameters up to the chirp mass, which sets the overall scale. And then the extra phase is what sets the intrinsic parameters. So again, if I look at the signal that I wrote here, right? So the amplitude is just setting the mass, distance, and angle, some combination of the angles, where it, where it arrives is decided by the sky location and the coalescence time. And the absolute phase, so whether you know it's going like a cosine or a sine here, so that is not really a deep quantity, it is just set by some where the merger is in its lifetime. Right? And all the intrinsic parameters are encoded in the evolution of the frequency with time or the phase phi of x. So, you can sort of the problem sort of factors into these two halves under these simple assumptions that I mentioned, right? That there's only one polarization, there's only one mode, and there are no, there's no extra things like infinite spins, etc. Okay, so let's look at the intrinsic parameters. So, how does the phi of f look like? I already gave you the leading order piece of phi of f. So and these are so for a post Newtonian kind of orbit. So that is not sufficiently far away from merger. So you can expand it in terms of the velocity, Keplerian velocity, v, which is related to the frequency by this power. So you can freely move between the frequency and the velocity. And you have this Sorindus expression for the phase as a function of the frequency. And it's not super important what these numbers are, but basically the point is that, so you have a leading order piece which goes as V to the minus five, which is this F to the minus three piece that I mentioned previously. And then you have a bunch of other power laws. You know, all powers of V can be replaced with powers of F. So essentially the phase, you can think of it as some function and then you're fitting it with a series of power laws. Then the coefficients of the fits, determine, for example, the chirp mass, and then the next power term de determines the mass ratio, and then the next power start determining the spins. And then after a point, you start running out of independent parameters. And then each new power term that you start to detect gives you improved constraints on your existing parameters. Are those numbers exact? Yes, within JL. I mean, I don't know of anyone who actually memorizes them, but they're exactly <laughs> like they come out of the calculation. Yes. What's gamma? I think here gamma is oh, yeah, the only constant. Yeah, it, it's it's point five seven seven. Yes. Oh, black gamma. Okay, and then finally you have this extra piece here which is where all the, so all of the other pieces, they depend on things that are relevant for, even for binary black holes. Right, and this last piece here is where something is different if you have a, you know, matter instead of something with horizons. So, and these are 
essentially describing the finite size effects. Okay. Can I ask, <clears throat> is there a particular reason for which you choose to order the just like that with BQ, B to the fourth, log B, B to the sixth? Am I doing correctly? I just understand. Uh, uh, you're wondering why I put the log. Is the reason because when you consider all of those numbers, you know that's the uh, uh, natural. Uh, what's this? Uh, okay. Beyond, uh, apart from the log terms, the remainder are just increasing powers of v. Yes, but this is v over c, right? And, uh, yes. Yes. So, and that would be uh, smaller with higher powers, but of course the numbers. Those I, I cannot do the calculation in my head, but you know I assume. Yeah, that they order in that way because each time continues less and less. No, so the, there is no law that the coefficients have to be small. Okay. It's a decimal. Yeah, when I see the C is usually when you see that, that then you end up you know, adding less and less. Is that the natural law that goes that's not that as much? I don't think it has been proved what you know how how the series behaves. Or maybe someone here can correct me. Yeah, so, so the the fourth line, and this is maybe not important, but with with the log, is it just did you put it fourth on the slide because the other three? It should be a B five there. Yeah, I think I missed it. Okay. Okay. So, so now we come to the first part of the talk, which is about. The effect of the finite sizes of the objects on the signal that we see. So this is a cartoon picture of a numerical relativity simulation of a merger. Right. And there are people in this room who know more about this than me. So this is you have a sort, sort of sort of prescription for how you build the neutron stars. And then after you have done that, then you let it go and you track it till the point where you you know consider that you stop computing. And so in the beginning, it kind of looks like the signals that I sketched before. And then there is some mass near the merger. And then in this simulation, it settles down to some state that slowly decays. But so these things are at the current time, they are not really observable because the frequency of the sensitive frequency of the detector sort of cuts off here. Yeah. So at this point, it's fair to say that we really can understand and also detect or have a hope of detecting anything that happens at this point. So in this talk, I will focus mostly on that. Right. So in this part is work done by Han Yu, who's a postdoc at KITP, and James, who's a student at UCSP. So, okay, so let's first begin with understanding what the effect of this extra term, the finite size term, is. So here, you know, this term has some large power of m sitting here, and then it has some dimension full quantity lambda here, which I haven't explained what it is, but ultimately this whole term is some dimensionless number lambda tilde. And this lambda tilde, the reason, so if you notice, this is a very large power of V. So you would, if you, if you assume that there is some hierarchy, then these terms should not be important. And the reason why it is even, you know, important is that this coefficient is large for realistic models. The neutron star is not, is not too small. So, so then for the, so, this is comparing how the waveforms look like. If you add, you know, particular values of lambda tilde, and you can see that, so the waveform appears like it's, you know, it's getting to the end faster. So this is a characteristic feature of the finite size, which is that the evolution of the phase has changed, and the waveform looks shorter in time. But of course, you can't just deduce it from this because this is degenerate with other we understand correctly, you are saying that this is going to depend on the mass and the size, but so far you are not concerned about the, for example, the equation of state of the neutron star, or that will come up later. So all of that, this thing hides all the complexity of the equation of state. Because ultimately this thing, it, 
it is set by how the neutron star responds to uh, applied field, tidal field. That's what I'm going to talk about. Okay, but I would have thought that that would actually depend on the equation of state. Yes, it uh, does. It, it, that, that lambda value is determined, determined by the equation of state. And it is why we want to measure this so that we can get some handle of the equation of state. Yeah, from the perspective of data analysis, it is just a number. But then, you know, you want to assign a physical meaning to that number, then that's where the equation of state. Mm. Okay, so the puzzle that we were interested in answering is so this is a numerical relativity simulation of a binary neutron star merger at the time state of the art. And this is showing a model waveform constructed using the simple formula that I wrote down earlier with some changes. And so this is the waveform itself. And here I'm what is being shown is as a function of the time to the merger, the difference from the numerical relativity phase. So you can just take the numerical relativity waveform and compute the phase. And you can look at the phase that your formula gives you and see the difference. And so the simple formula that I wrote, that I wrote down is essentially the adiabatic tides, the two PN term. And I'll explain what that means in a minute. And then you can see that you know there have been better sort of physics and models and they go down to these dynamical tides but you still have around a radian of so of extra phase shift that is not described by your formula and but then when you want to do data analysis you need some waveform to compare to the data so then people have built approximants which are just some cooked up sort of interpolants, which kind of add these extra terms by hand, and then just say whatever value they need to be for the formula to agree with the numerical relativity simulation. So these, you know, they, they are like, you can think of them as some sort of tuning parameters. And ultimately, I just need a machine that given a lambda or given some equation of state, it spits out a phase. So that machine is the formula plus some correction that is calibrated this way. Yeah. This order one change in phase. Yeah. How sensitive is it to the precise equation of state being used in numerical relativity simulations? Yeah. So before we began this, I don't think people knew. So part of this motivation was to understand this. Because of course, if you if you just believe that I'm numerical relativity is the ground truth, then you just run a simulation for everything you want to do, but it is expensive. Yeah. Even numerical relativity, presumably if they use different equation of state, yeah. then if the change in the difference in the phase would be yeah. in a different amount. You're yes. asking about the, the, how the error depends on the equation of state, not the, the magnitude. Do you care about the magnitude? Wait, wait, no, I thought you were asking about the magnitude. Sorry, the magnitude is the size of mm -hmm. this delta phi, right? Is it true that it's more than one? Right so now. that's a very high order, high, high resolution simulation because the, the numerical activity simulation has an error and then that causes your system to merge early. So if you do set low resolution, you will not resolve this. So you really need oh. to go to very, very high resolution. Oh, I see. Then you will see some difference, but maybe as we will hear, the difference is actually not fully understood. Like there was a study earlier this year by people in Jena basically highlighting some issues. And then it oh, I see. Yeah, so I talked about our work where I think we achieved some partial understanding of this. So there still remains work to be done. So to understand this, so let's get to why the phase shift is happening. So there is the neutron star, which is in the tidal field of its companion, which in the binding neutron star case is another neutron star. If it's a neutron star black hole, it's another black hole. It's a black hole, but whatever it be right so there is a there is a tidal forcing which is like a grade so here it's a i'm giving the force vector it's the gradient of a tidal potential and so in the presence of this tidal potential so the internal oscillations or internal motions of the neutron star get excited so these are so this is just a cartoon taken from in where we were about astro seismology so this kind of internal motions are studied in other contexts, right? And so the simple picture is 
So if I write down, let's, so here, uh, a flaw of this work, which I will get to some possible resolutions, is that we all did it in kind of a new, in a Newtonian way. But so it, it is expected to break down close to the margin. But at the point where we are talking, like it is actually a decent approximation. So then, so let's say that I have, I look at the displacements of the matter elements inside the neutron star. So I can write it as a vector in phase space. So there's a position and a momentum. Uh, instead, instead of position, now it's a displacement and the velocity. <clears throat> right, and then you can write a Hamiltonian for the phase space. So the Hamiltonian has a P square piece and then a quadratic piece in the displacement. So this is the restore origin of the restoring force. This, this is the spring constant. And then there is an external forcing. The external forcing in this case is the tidal potential. Right, and now if you have this complicated problem, so this C, what I've written here is some complicated operator involving a lot of gradients, a lot of, you know, vector, vector, vector uh, quantities. But if you think of it as an operator on the space of all displacements, then you can, if the neutron star is non-rotating, then you can diagonalize this operator. You can solve the eigenvalue equation. And then the eigenvalues and eigenvectors, they essentially form pairs of frequencies and modes, normal modes for the star. And then you can de decompose your phase space, motion into in phase space, into a sum of motions of these modes. Right? It's some coefficients that then, in order to describe your displacement, all you need to know is this evolution of these coefficients. And just like Usual, if the C has some good properties, which it does in a non-rotating neutron star, then you can make them orthogonal. And again, since it's a non-rotating neutron star, the problem has rotational symmetry about all axes. So then the, you can expect that the angular behavior of these modes is, described, is just some spherical harmonics multiplied by some radial function. These modes are usually indexed by three numbers. So one angular number, two, two numbers describing the angular behavior and one which is describing the number of radial nodes. Okay. okay, I didn't get to, I didn't put in any numbers, but okay, for, for a neutron star, for typical neutron stars of, you know, masses of around 1.4 solar masses and sizes of around 10 kilometers, these modes, they there is a the most important mode is called the fundamental mode of the neutron star, which is roughly square root. The frequency is roughly square, you know, it's like one over the dynamical time. So that is around 1.4 kilohertz or so for a simple model. Simple, uh, it's around the kilohertz scale. The 1.4 don't take it too seriously because it can change, but that is the scale. So it is kind of out of band compared to where we are seeing most of the signal to noise ratio for this event to come in. And then there are also even higher frequency modes, which are like high order sound waves, which can go to megahertz. And then there are also low frequency modes called buoyancy modes, which can live in, in the LIGO band. So in this talk, I'm going to assume there are no buoyancy modes. So, and all of these terms are assuming that the neutron star is actually not rotating. Yeah. Right. And can you handle the fact that it actually that's probably not the case and the frequency floor is close to the frequency? I mean, that has been treated in the literature. Our calculation can't handle it. Most neutron stars will not be spinning that kind of merger. Like they're not synchronized because they don't have enough viscosity to dissipate and spin up. They're not tidally locked, yeah, but you can exactly. small spin, but it'll be small. So if you have, instead of neutron stars, you have two white dwarfs, then you would expect that they get tidally locked because the merger is very slow. Mm -hmm. Neutron star mergers are very fast. So mm -hmm. it's kind of unlikely to that they will get tidally locked. Uh, just suppose you can't stop being, you know, spun up by accretion, but that's not what they have. Yeah, yeah. So if you have something that was spinning to begin with, then yes, it can happen. What is the typical orbital frequency at the time? It's, it's the right question because that's a challenge. Like, 
maybe ask my question now since you brought this up. Like this work from earlier this year was basically comparing the fundamental mode to the frequency at which the stars actually touch and yes. no longer have a single star, but it's more like a mesh of two. Yes. For some equations of state, that happens before you reach that frequency. So their, their claim was maybe you never trigger this simply because you never go as far in the frequency evolution before you actually smash them together. Yeah, so for, I, I think the calculation I'm going to describe assumes that the fundamental frequency is above whatever frequency that we are experiencing at. Is it, is it clear how much force, how much you could drive that frequency even if you drive it at lower frequency, like if you're below the resonance? Yeah, so then below the resonance, this whatever calculations I described below. Yeah, okay. I, I'll get to some, I, okay, let, let me get to, let me continue and tell you something. Okay, so modulo this, so now if with this mode expansion in hand, you can write down the equation for the evolution of the phase space and then decompose it in terms of these modes. And then you get just an equation for forced harmonic oscillators, right? So the C are the coefficients of the phase space expansion. And C dot plus I omega C is some term, which is a driving term. So the driving term is, you can think of it as the projection of the forcing term into the basis of the modes. So, and if you actually want to know what it is, this driving term depends steeply on the displacement between or the distance between the stars as one over r cube for the lowest order ones. And then it has some angular terms in general, but the angular terms actually sort of don't matter for the lowest order ones. They are all this, the, the coefficients are all the same for the lowest order ones. Okay, so let's look at so so far my discussion was purely formal. So if I look at the lowest order modes. Right, so the something like the F mode. So you can think of it as a, the, again, there is an infinite sequence of modes. So they will have modes with all sorts of angular numbers. But the fundamental frequency I mentioned was for a quadrupolar mode. Right. So here are the three spherical harmonics. Right. That kind of describe how the <laughs> how the tidal potential or the mode eigenfunction looks like as a function of where you are on the sphere. Right. So, oops. Can I ask you a question? It's very bad. Can I ask a quick question? So, so I don't get confused. So, if I title the potential and then you uh, understand the product of the modes of this. Uh, in the yes. yes. Now, actually, these are together and whatever is this one coming to this one is the other way around. Yes. Is that something you're considering? The fact that, you know, when when this one is uh, oscillating, that, you know. Yeah, as long as they are sufficiently far apart, you can do each of them independently. When they're close enough, then you have to do a numerical literature simulation. But at the moment, you're still considering, you know, this one is uh, oscillating the fix. Well, so when they're sufficiently far away, then the tidal potential is not described by so many numbers. Okay. Okay, okay. That's why. But that's what you're thinking right now. Okay, okay. Yeah, so when you touch, probably you shouldn't apply this calculation. Yeah. Okay. So again, so as I mentioned, right, so the evolution of the, the forcing of the modes, it depends on the coupling of this forcing function into the basis of the modes. So for the, for the most important lowest order quadrupolar modes, right, so this tidal forcing, it, it has some part in, so here, if I, if I use a basis that is along the path, along the direction to the companion, then there's only one term. If I use a basis that is, for example, orthogonal to the orbital plane, then all three are you know, non-zero. So these two in plane sort of, so you know, if x, y, x square minus y square terms, they are equally excited. And then the cosine square theta minus one third term, right, the two zero term, is excited to a smaller amplitude. So, right. So, and now it's not static. The companion is moving around. So now the, that means that the forcing term has a time dependence. And the time dependence is given by the orbital frequency multiplied by M 
the angular uh, quantum number of the mode or you know the angular uh, constant for the spherical harmonic. So the excitation for this mode is not time dependent. It's just like something is already always keeping it squashed. And the excitations for these modes, they are non-zero. And one of the modes, let's say the two two becomes what you would call a prograde mode. And one of them becomes a retrograde mode. So the if you if you were standing there and looking at it, one of these modes, you would see the swell going like this. And one of the modes, you'd see the swell going this way. And the orbit is going one way. So one of them will become prograde. One of them will become retrograde. So, so this was the harmonic oscillator equation. And as I mentioned, the force thing has a time dependence. So a for, you know that a forced harmonic oscillator, it oscillates at the frequency of the forcing. So you expect that the coefficient CA also goes as d to the minus m i n a times phi, right? The same, the same term that determines the time dependence of VA. <laughs> so if you take out that dominant piece, then you get an equation that just says that basically once you enter the rotating frame, right? So the CA dot plus now there is this term which describes, which is different for the prograde and the retrograde modes. Right. And then there's a VA sitting here. All the time dependence has been taken, the, the orbital change has been taken out. So now if you, so if you just assume that this term is small, so once you enter the co-rotating frame, the, every, the excitation is not changing very quickly on an orbital time scale. Then you get an equation for the amplitude of the modes, or at least, so you're taking out the dominant rotation, but then the amplitude, is just related by a simple constant times the forcing function. And so in the literature in the past, so if you are operating in the limit where the orbit is infinitely slow compared to the oscillation frequency of the mode, this goes away and CA is just VA. Okay. But now let's say that the orbit is not infinitely slow. Let's say MA times omega becomes close to the frequency of the, na the natural frequency of the mode then you can have a resonance. So you can have what is called resonant enhancement. So yeah, by some sort of, yeah, I, don't, I don't think it's the right terminology in terms of oscillations, but it's in the literature, this is called a dynamical type. So you can think, so if I go back to, So if I, if I look at the adiabatic tile and then the dynamical tile, so the, the, once you add the dynamical tile, once you add this minus M times omega, it helps, it helps it, you know, it, it helps you reconcile yourself with the simulations a bit better, but it's not all the way there. Okay, so this was a partial explanation for the discrepancy between the simple calculations that I wrote in, in the very beginning and the numerical liquidity it takes you part of the way. But then there is still this remaining factor. So in order to understand the remaining factor, so let's add in the next sets of terms that enter because here I've just as in so far I've assumed that the displacements are small. So the change in the energy, which is the Hamiltonian, is just quadratic in the displacement. And let's say that now the displacements can be larger, as would happen when you start to get closer. Then you can start having cubic terms and quartic terms in the Hamiltonian. Right? So these are three more and four more couplings. And you can also have what is called nonlinear driving, where in the simple linear case, essentially each harmonic of the type talk to a mode of the same numbers, right? But now you can have a case where each harmonic of the type talks to two modes, such that they obey the selection rules, right? So there are some numbers that describe each of the modes, and then there is a number that describes the angular behavior of the tidal potential. And if all of them obey the selection rules, 
then you can start to have pairs that, and you have terms that have these pairs. So all of these terms uh, exist now. So if I go back to this prograde and retrograde modes, right, and call this mod A, mod B, and mod C, right? So mod C, remember, is the mode that does not oscillate, right? Because the tidal potential is not oscillating. Tidal potential is sort of fixed for this mode, right? And these modes, the tidal potential is changing. And you, you know, so you, you can write down some horrendous expressions that basically come up by taking this term and putting all the terms that can come in. But the important piece is that there are terms on the right hand side for let's say CA that have something like CA and then a coefficient here. And this coefficient, it's possible because the tidal potential has a piece that has no angular behavior, this two zero piece. So then that, mean you, that means you can talk to the mode and it's conjugate. So then this is a piece that behaves like mode square. So it's like a frequency. And similarly, <laughs> you have other pieces here that also have CA sitting there. And what is important is that the tidal potential has a piece that does not vary with time. It's this thing that keeps it scrunched up. So if you have that, then all of these terms essentially are corrections to the frequency of the mode. So that means that the displacement, the, the nonlinear terms are correcting the frequency of the mode. And what do, what do the other terms do? Right. So the other terms, yeah, I don't have such a simple picture for you, unfortunately. Even more couple between different models. Yes, so, so they're like, you know, diff so if you didn't have the other terms, these are all like independent harmonic oscillators. And the other terms cause them to talk to each other. Yeah, this is what I'm trying to understand. So if I understand the structure of the problem, you're setting it up to, you know, if I think about the matrix, instead of, you know, being able to solve it just like a bunch of and you have some band structure because you have, you know, yes. 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 I'm trying to understand how you can actually make the statement that you just made, being that the premise, you know, is intrinsically coupled. Because it, I can make that statement because there is this this piece oh, because that, that does not vary with time. It's sort of felt fixed as the orbitals move. It only changes on this radiation reaction time scale, not on the orbital time scale. Are those both coupling terms a bit legible compared to the self self interacting? Yeah. Terms? So for so here I. I'm showing the numbers for the polytrope model. So again, if you're a simulator, probably you won't take this very seriously. But so these extra terms, they are not, they're they are correct, they're small corrections. They don't change you, they would they don't change by you know an order of magnitude. So you can sort of estimate what the frequency correction is, and it basically goes as F square. So if you remember, F is like VQ. So this is like a V to the six direction. And then the only P, the only thing that you need in order for to calculate the frequency shifts are these coefficients J2 and K2, which is, you know, so here, okay, the things are off, but they are just some tabulated numbers. And how do you get these numbers? You get these numbers by integrating some modes over the background. So let's say you have an equation of state, then you solve the background structure, and then you can also solve the mode eigenfunctions by diagonalizing the Hamiltonian or the, you know, the restoring force piece. And then you get these mode eigenfunctions, and then you just integrate and compute these coupling coefficients. So it's just like you just like you do cal calculate a love number, you're calculating two other numbers. That's it. And once you have them, then you have this frequency shift. And you can, okay, in order to get an answer without solving a differential equation, we can do some approximations and we can get an answer for the change to the mode amplitude compared to the simple, uh, compared to the simple sort of dynamical type picture I wrote earlier. There were just some extra terms. Like that are that you can compute in the same way. 
And once you have those terms, then you know now a, a change. You, you know you now know the change to the amplitude of the modes. And once you know the change to the amplitude of the modes, then you know the change to the energy that is contained inside these modes. So then, once you have a sink of energy that you know what the en energy is, then you can compute the rate of change of the in spiral. Right? Just as the rate of change of the phase is it depends on how this energy changes with the with the uh, semi major axis say, or the frequency and once you have that then oops. so so this is the delta phi as a function of frequency so this is the okay i don't have the okay so this is the linear piece so this is essentially comparable to the dynamical tide piece that I showed in the beginning when as motivation. And then you have an extra shift here in the right direction, which is the nonlinear, which is the correction due to this case. And it is at a similar order of magnitude, you know, within a factor of few of the phase shift seen in numerical relativity. And the reason we didn't get the exact factor of few, factor of one or two correct, is we used a simplified equation of state. And the second thing is that we neglected some very important things, which is that we did Newtonian calculations. And the orbit, doing Newtonian calculations for the orbit is fine. But an important correction is that the neutron stars have a potential well. Right? So once you do it in GR, then for example, the mode frequencies are red shifted seen by the, seen by the orbit. So once you add that, you will get a change that we have not computed here. And we can kind of estimate the order of magnitude of that change, and we get that it's in the right direction and has the right size, but we haven't computed it. So at least this tells us that we can compute this extra phase shift without doing a numerical relativity simulation, modulo just having the ability to compute these two extra co constants from which you get from solving the mode structure of the neutron star. Can I clarify you ignoring the cross couplings with other modes in this? Yeah, so here I put in the cross couplings here and the effect of the cross couplings is, is small for these for the systems that we have seen. The obvious why. I don't have a simple answer for you. We can take a look. As a coefficient selection was up, obviously. Yes. The same order yeah. magnitude. Yeah, I understand. <clears throat> I don't mean to say what I didn't say, but I, you say that um, you essentially can infer how the orbit will shrink by seeing how much energy is being dumped into the modes. Yes. <clears throat> This is this is not unique to this calculation. This is also how it is done in the standard calculation. Yeah, maybe even another. This is just a change to the energy that is dumped in because the mode amplitude has. Changed. Yeah, but the question is, you know, what about? I mean, there has to be some assumption. This is still when things are far away enough. Yes. Because the moment I start being things close enough, yeah. there are other things of energy. Yes. So we kind of pretended. Yeah. So when you get here, you should not trust these answers. But we can we you know evolve the equations there anyway, and it did not blow up. But yeah, I would not. I would want to do uh, if I before saying that we have solved it completely. I would try to do a GR calculation, but it should be possible to do it without having a numerical yeah. How does that compare to current fixes that are way for models? Yeah, it's, I mean people it, already have like this. Yes, yes, sir. The, the size is correct. Is, is, in the, is in the ballpark. Okay, so the size is okay. Yeah. Did you by any chance do an inference with this thing versus the standard thing? No. Because that would be interesting. I mean, there was this claim that if you neglect dynamical tides, I think in the next generation facilities, you might like get the radius wrong. I, was I think by the time the next generation comes, I would want to do the GR calculation. <laughs> you still have more than a decade. Well, I, I mean, I think those claims are even saying that if you had something like 17 or 17 with, uh, like in the 05 observing run, that neglecting dynamical tides can significantly bias 
I, I think that's true. So, so maybe before the next decade, <laughs> we'll want the GR version of this one. Yeah, but I guess my my more realistic statement would be that you know you can do a lot of work and compute this, but maybe by that time you are also get better at simulating it, and then you have a good formula that works. And why do you care? I mean, you, you you cannot properly simulate this if you don't know I, what I'm looking for. I, I'm just talking as someone who doesn't simulate. <laughs> Simulation just gives you gives you the sum of everything, and yeah, if you don't know what the individual pieces are. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. This is more like theoretically motivated than this fitting function that we put. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we started with these fitting functions were have been known for a while or have been done completed for a while, but we wanted to understand them. You just fit the functional form of your correction. Uh, I can fit the terms that go into it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I, I can fit. I haven't and this is the better. I haven't done all that yet. <laughs> Okay, I have like literally 10 minutes left for the second part of my talk. So maybe I'll just skip quickly to the yeah, so one, one last question. So if you just have to give a scale, you know, physical scale, you know, on the separation of the clinical sums to which you know, you know assumptions are okay. So you just have a sense. Are we talking about 10, you know, the neutral star radius or something like this? Or it's the top axis, right? I don't see that here. The separation in units. Okay, I didn't see that. Okay, thanks. I mean, it appears close, but remember that the tidal potential decays as one over R Q. Even at three R, right, it, even though it appears close, the tidal you, know, you can still kind of do decent calculation. You mean like two to three orbits. That's fine. Right. Even closer in, depending on the right. Okay. In the last part, I will very quickly talk about the second thing, which is about a different thing, which is so. This was theoretical, and then the second thing is let's say you have these events as we have now. We want to improve the process by which we infer the parameters of these events from data. This is work that was done led by postdoc Javier Rolet and a grad student Tosu was visiting. So, okay, so this is just an overall workflow of how. That something goes from data to detection to where you know various people start taking pieces from it. And the most important thing is there are two pieces, two parts where you want to know what the parameters of the events are. The first thing is after you have found events, you want to tell the observers where to point the telescopes. And the second thing is after you have found enough of them, beyond having a rough estimate for their parameters. You want to put all those parameters, you want to put all those detections together to draw astrophysical conclusions. So in both of these cases, you want to infer the parameters of the event from the data. And in the first part of the talk, when I presented basically an overall picture of how this is done, I had zero noise. This to the precision of your theoretical model. You know, if you know theory perfectly, then you can just look at the waveform and compute things, but in reality, we are not there. So now we have to do a more complicated process. So this is the same thing as earlier. And the standard way people do this is through the formalism of Bayesian inference. So you have some likelihood for the data given a set of parameters. And then you put you fold in your prior and you get the posterior distribution for the parameters that you want to understand and sample from it. So the likelihood is simple. So for the for gravitational wave data, the likelihood is just a Gaussian function of the data, of the residuals of the data. So right, after you subtract the model, and the weight of the covariance matrix of this Gaussian is just related to the power spectrum of the data. SOFF. So you can rewrite this likelihood as just some piece that talks it, it. The only thing that touches the data is the template or the signal edge of edge of theta. Then there is a piece where the signal talks to itself, but the data is not involved. So, as I mentioned, right, so the under the simplifying assumptions I mentioned earlier, binary mergers are 15 parameters, but in reality, you don't really constrain all of them. So, there is a lot of degeneracy. And there are also 
some significant amounts of multimodality. So there are you know different islands in parameter space, largely extrinsic parameters. So this is like an example of the some slice through the posterior distribution of some of the events of one of the events. And we would like to have something like this, but often it's not possible. And there are some cases where we can kind of cleverly choose coordinates to get there, but <coughs> that is not by itself enough. So we want to find a, find a fast way of doing this inference. And so why is it how is, as I mentioned, the part that touches the data is the overlap of the data with the template. And the free, so, and the computational cost is just the cost of computing this overlap. And the frequency resolution is set by how much time you're observing. And the number of frequencies is set by the maximum frequency you're allowing in your analysis. The combination tells you that you have to basically every time you compute this uh, these overlaps, let's say you even compute it for all times with an FFT, you still have to use a large number of floating point operations. And you want to do it many times because you're sampling a posterior. So this is what makes it if you just do it brute force, you know, in a simplistic generic generic code, it can take months. So then we would like to know how to, we would like to do it faster. So one thing that has been done in the literature, which is kind of a very clever code, is called Baystar. And this is what is used by LIGO to alert observers because they don't want to give the alerts one, you know, one month later when the event has faded. So what they do is that they make the same simplifying assumptions I mentioned earlier. And again, notice the fact that the intrinsic and extrinsic parameters, they are separate blocks, they sort of factor out. So then you can just say that I'm not going to explore the intrinsic parameters because it's not so important for the observers. And I just want to get very good estimates of where it is on the sky and how far it is so that observers know what to do. So then you can try to maximize the intrinsic parameters, which is a good, which is done by research pipelines often. And then once you have done that, then you can explore the posterior and the extrinsic parameters only. And this can be done very quickly because the cho different choices of extrinsic parameters, you don't need to call a waveform again. It just come, you ch change times and phases. So that is done, it is, it is free. So then this can be done very quickly. So this can take order seconds and you get observers get the alerts quickly. But in cases of many events, what happened is that so this event gave some alerts earlier. And then after the full PE has been done, you find sky maps that are different. They're not like completely different, but you know, if you're not an observer, this kind of look okay. But if you're an observer, you know, there are like many, many, many galaxies in every pixel of this image. So this is not good. You would like to not, like you spent a lot of resources on observing this patch and then it fluctuated again. You would, maybe you're not happy with that. So then you would want to get the full answer quickly. And the second thing is you also want at the time of detection, many times it is not clear what the parameters of events are because of the complicated degeneracies that are in the parameter space. So as I mentioned to leading order, so let's say you have M1 and M2. You don't really measure these very well. You only measure a combination, which is the chirp mass well. So your contours of uncertainty, they stretch across the space. And now you can report some estimate of how much is in each region because observers want to observe a binary neutron star and not a binary black hole. So they want to make the decision. And this is not done optimally because you don't have the intrinsic parameter estimates very well. So this is another reason for having the full thing quickly. Okay. I have literally a few minutes left. so. Okay, this is something that we did when I was here, so maybe I can skip it. <laughs> so, so this is this. So this is so. As I mentioned, there are two things that we need to think about. One is the intrinsic parameters, and one is the extrinsic parameters. So, the intrinsic parameters, which are you know the masses and spins, if you change them, you can use the fact that. You are not drawing some random shapes that a kid is drawing on the board, but you are living in a manifold that you kind of understand. So then you can 
say that I'm not exploring all random shapes, but I'm exploring a set of shapes that live in some low dimensional space where the space is, you know, if you knew what it was, if you knew how to compress it, then you could do it very quickly. So then the idea is that the signal to noise ratio, it depends on how the phase builds up with time or frequency. So then if, if we, with this understanding, you can see that any two waveforms that have high likelihood, they have phase functions that are only different by small perturbations. They are not like random phase functions. So then you can explore this smaller space much more economically than you can explore the space of random functions. So with this, and then you can use the structure of the likelihood to basically drastically reduce your frequency resolution that you need. So instead of requiring million you know points you end up you can sort of un, you can compute hundred numbers that characterize this space of all waveforms that have a high likelihood and this reduces the cost of intrinsic parameter evaluation by like, evaluation by orders of magnitude and then the second thing which is extrinsic parameters is we can under we can see that once the intrinsic parameters factor out then the extrinsic parameters so there is a piece that depends on the intrinsic parameters, which you don't have control over. And, but then there is an extrinsic parameter piece, which does not require you to eva evaluate the waveform again and again. So then this piece, so essentially you can avoid passing that to your Markov chain Monte Carlo sample. So sample only the intrinsic parameters. And then, but instead of get sampling, instead of passing the likelihood of the full model, you pass the marginalized likelihood over the extrinsic parameters, which you can compare, which you can compute very inexpensive. It's a very similar algorithm to what Bayes standards. But you have just reduced the dimensionality of the problem massively. So if you do this, okay, I'm really I should end up. So I there is some there, there is just some numbers you can compute using the intrinsic parameters, and then you just keep drawing things randomly from these numbers and combining them with some weights. And then you get some good, very good approximation to the full likelihood. And once you do this, we can get parameter, inf we can get the full parameter inference, well, not full because we haven't done it for the misaligned sprints yet. But we can do it in a few tens to 100 seconds on, on like my laptop. So this thing, yeah, so normally it can take days, and even that requires you know several requires significant computing resources, maybe even GPUs or something. But this thing I can just do it on my laptop. So, so this is something that is very useful both for giving alerts with full information, and it also enables us to now industrially use parameter inference for wherever we want. So let's say we want to do this population inference, and we want to understand how it works. We want to maybe test some things. Maybe even we want to do some forecasts for future detectors or whatever. But then we can do that in without using all the computers in the world. I should end here because I'm out of time. So. If there are like few questions, please do. Can you maybe this is exactly what I was asking about? Can you also comment on how well you get the sky localization in this graphic? Yeah, so here I'm showing the difference between the sky localization we get and the full sky localization that is in the LVC samples. And the different, so they also give sky localizations for, or we can also do the full inference ourselves for injections. And when we, the only differences we see are because of waveform models that have precession or higher harmonics. So because of that, the tails of the distributions can be different because these extra physics, they kind of talk to the extrinsic parameters as well. But if you just have use the same waveform model, which is aligned spin quadruple, then we get the same posteriors, just cheaper. Yeah. The comparison here is against building though. Yeah. Is that what they use for the initial maps that they cut out or do they use? No, no, this is the final. So this is the, so, so your, your, the fast algorithm is comparable to what they got with the, the Any more burning questions? Okay, I think, let's thank you again.